this like this hip hop stuff, especially around the time where I I felt like it was lacking. You know, like when I really got into hip hop was when uh, uh, Dr. Dre stuff started hitting uh, pretty hard in the '90s, and uh, I, I was into it because it was melodic. It was you know, had yeah, Dr. Dre had these you know re uh, repetitious drum patterns, but he had all these like musical elements. You know, he had people doing string sections and and playing piano solos and parts and whatnot. And it was, it was really inspiring. I didn't really think that you could do that with hip hop, you know, but there's, there's, no, there's no rules. It's a, it's a, a genre that has uh, no limits and it's, uh, it's been created by all these other types of music. So. And so, I mean, you listed some Dre and some Bone Thugs and Harmony. Hey, uh, don't say it like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll play it. <laughs> play it. So you're listening to some Dre, some Bone Thugs, and um, and so you, you finally decide that you know you're gonna get you know your chops on and, and you know start to you know bang. Yeah, I mean I was I was like 14 at the time, you know when I first started making music. My cousin, he's a, he's a guitar player. He made a lot of music on his computer, and he had all these drum machines and whatnot. And you know, he he started passing me things because I'd always be at his house playing video games and whatnot. And, Eventually, yeah, just I started getting into it, and um, you know, I was again like getting getting to be like 18, and it's time to start thinking about your future. And for whatever reason, I was like, you know, I think I'd, I'd rather just make movies or study film. And so I, I went to film school, went to college, and, and did that whole thing. And in in college, I met this kid, Doctor Strange Loop, whose whose music I just released like last week. Or, the week before. We'll get on that. Yeah, we'll get on that. Um, yeah, he showed me that you could make music on a laptop. I was blown away. <laughs> I, I was just like, I was watching this kid in the hallway. He, you know, he was that kid, the, the college kid who didn't talk to nobody. He had like, he had a couple friends, but he, he just, he trusted his sketchbook and his computer more than folks. And um, it was cool, you know, he showed me some things. And, um, and I, I started missing class, man. <laughs> I stopped going to class to make tunes. And, uh, and I was just like, you know what, I'm going to move back to L.A. And, and just really focus on this film shit. And it just slowly became music. And that was all I did. And um, yeah, here we are. And, you know, obviously in between, you mentioned, uh, I mean, sort of as you kind of progress back into some music, uh, we toured a little bit with your with uh, John. Yeah, you see yeah, the world, obviously. Yeah, I uh, I started working on a documentary on my aunt uh, in the later years of her life, and uh, I was able to go to a, a few places and go to a few countries. I went to India with her, and uh, I also went to, to France with her and shot one of her her uh, her concerts there. And uh, when I ended up playing at this venue months ago, which was crazy. And I didn't even realize until I was backstage looking at the wall, I was like, wait a second. Right, right, I was here. I was here. I've been here before. And you know, here, here I am playing it. And it was just, it was crazy. I, didn't, I never expected that. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I was working on this thing with her and, uh, you know, I had, I remember there was a point where she was like, "Hey, man, I want to see, I want to see what's happening with this footage. I want to see something." And uh, I gave her all the stuff I shot, so she could look it over and say, "Oh, well, that's cool," you know. But uh, months later, she passed away, unfortunately. And uh, I don't know if she ever got a chance to look at that stuff, but uh, <laughs> I gotta get those tapes somehow and try and finish this documentary. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, reading that you know somebody asked you if. Uh, you were an artist one day, and I believe that was in Paris. And yeah, it was, it was that time actually when I was doing the documentary. Um, you know, I was, again, I was really into my film stuff, and, and uh, we got picked up by a driver at the airport. And uh, he looked around, and you know, it was me and my cousin Robbie, who's also an incredible jazz musician, who plays the saxophone. I'm with these people, you know, I'm with these, these incredible people. I'm there with my camera. And, the, the driver, he asked, he asked my aunt, he was like, oh, so you, you guys all musicians? And they're like, yeah, 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 we do music here and there. And he looks at me and I'm like, no, 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 no. 
I'll just, and she's like, no, 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 he's a musician too, he's doing this. It was really, it was really uh, sweet. And um, I'm glad actually, because, you know, she, she got a chance to hear some things. And uh, I wish I wish she could hear the stuff now, but it's all good. She she knows what's up. She knows what's in the world. So I mean, so now you're back in LA, you know, pretty much, and, and yeah. you know the the, the, the mu- I mean the, the the film is is tapering off, if not has tapered off completely. And now, okay, so tapering off. Yeah, yeah, yeah tapering and, off. Um, and <laughs> and uh, your your the music is is becoming a bigger part of of, of your life. Uh, and you're producing, you know, putting some stuff together. Um, who, who basically gave you the first little list and was like, yo, I'm gonna give you a shot. Yeah, all right, so when I, after school, I moved back to LA and I, uh, I was doing photography. I was doing a lot of photography for, for people. I, I just looked on MySpace, seeing who was, you know, doing stuff in a little hip hop scene in LA. And I met this guy named uh, Little Psy, named uh, John Robinson, and he was, he was doing this project with MF Doom, and he, uh, yeah, he, he had me around. I was, I was uh, filming some of his shows and taking pictures and stuff, and all the while I've been making tunes. Nothing too special, but you know, I was making stuff. And he was, just, he was such a cool guy, and, and uh, just really encouraging me to, to keep doing my stuff. He heard a couple of things, and he was like, oh yeah, okay. And one day he freestyled over my tune, and I was just like, so fucking jazzed up. It was oh really? You freestyled on my beat? <laughs> it's so sick. You know, I was, I was into it. Uh, uh, <laughs> You're feeling it. I was, I was on it, dude. I was on it. I was on the um, And uh, he, he eventually passed my music on to Carlos Nino, who, who does a uh, Spaceways Radio in LA, and also put together this compilation called The Sound of LA. Oh, Anyone got the compilation by the way, Sound of LA? No. Someone to pick up by all means. Yeah, I had a I had a, my first release on that thing and oh man, you think I was jazzed about the freestyle. <laughs> I had my first piece of vinyl. Oh my god, I still get that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Same word. <laughs> so Sound of LA, which I believe I think I think I picked it up on Boog. Shout outs to Move. So, um, you, that comes out, and uh, in your obviously, I mean, you have to join here. He was like super tough on me, like super tough. Like I gave him. I remember in passing, I must have given out like five CDs, five things. And like on the fifth one, he called me back that night. He was like, "Yeah, that, that track three, that track three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one." I say a word. I say a word. So now, uh, so after that little kind of you know stamp of approval and whatever, yeah. um, he kind of commissions uh, another little piece of work from you. Uh, I guess that might have been the, the remix. Oh yeah, yeah. I uh, you know being around that whole that whole scene kind of led me to um, this remix I did for Mia Doi Todd. Uh, Has anyone heard this one? No. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Run it, please. Um, <laughs> Well, I'll tell you a story. Okay, oh, sure. here. Um, I met I met this woman, Mia Doi Todd, a couple times, and people told me she was really dope. And I heard some of her music, and I was like, "Wow, that's cool. I think maybe I could do something with that." And I met it, like I said, I met her a few times. She didn't remember my name. She never remembered my name. And I was like, "All right, I make this remix, and she'll never ever forget my name after that." And uh, <laughs> well, not saying it's great because of it. So she, she didn't forget. Okay, you know, some a little bit nervous right there. Yeah, she didn't forget. 
get you up there. So after that comes out, and I'm sure once again, Nino is like, oh snap. So out of that basically is where 1983 came about. Yeah, um, I was asked by the same label to do an album. I did this thing. Uh, I had uh, I've been asked by a few a few little labels. The Sound and Color hit me out there like, oh, let's check this guy out. See you with this guy. Thank God you can go there by the way. But, huh? I said thank great great guys, but I mean that label went nowhere. Uh, you know, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna do all that talking. Yeah, no doubt. I'll just say it didn't work out, and I'm glad things worked the way they did. See, but. I did this thing for plug research, and uh, it was it was an experience, a really interesting one at that, because they uh, they really encouraged me to give them the other stuff, not the stuff that I gave them. You know, they wanted to hear the other shit, the weird shit, and I was like, really? y'all fucking with that? You want to hear that stuff? Yeah, okay, all right. And then, you know, I've just been on that, man. I, I, it flipped my whole wig. Like they don't, they don't want to hear stuff they've heard already. <laughs> you know, man, you're like, yeah, like, okay, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, I put that, I put the the record together, and it came out uh, during the time I went to the academy. Mm. Yeah. Let's uh, let's hear like a couple of joints. Oh, a couple. Come on, man. Come on. First of all, before I go there, yeah. um, who owns 1983 here? Show of hands. Okay, thank you. Not enough still, but we'll run. <laughs> By the way, uh, he was at the 2006 Academy in Melbourne. Yeah, Australia. That was crazy. Tell us about that quickly. Yeah, um, I was, I was, uh, I was kind of hearing things about the program because I, I looked up some some of the lectures that had happened over the past few sessions, and I was like, wow, this seems really cool. But yeah, you know, I don't feel like leaving the studio. I just want to work on my shit. Hey, don't tell me. Hey, don't tell me how to like use my machine better. I, I do what I do, you know what I mean? I came out with that attitude and it was such a dick thing, but <laughs> it really was, it was so stupid. But I'm really glad that I applied. Uh, I, was, I was told by uh, that girl, Ahu Dali, she, um, she uh, was like, dude, you gotta do it, it was great, I had such an amazing time, I'm like, all right, that application is fucking epic, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> So, I, you know, so I was lying, but hey, he didn't tell you, he didn't tell you, you gotta fucking like draw pictures and shit, you gotta like talk about dead people, all sorts of shit in that motherfucker. <laughs> but it was, it's really cool, and having done the program, I understand why they ask you all the questions they ask you, because they, I think they really want to just keep the family tight and keep like-minded folks around. And, um, and yeah, the, I mean, I applied and uh, I got that email that, that Henry was talking about. And um, funny, I, I haven't told this story ever, cool. ever. But uh, so it's the day, the day, where it's time to go to LAX. And I'm at the airport um, doing my little thing, punching in the city code at the window, like, yeah, I'm about to be out. And they're like, oh, you need to go to the desk and speak to somebody, which is fine, it happens, it happened on this trip. I go up to the desk and I say, uh, you were supposed to leave yesterday. 
Now this shit is cool if you're going to the Bay or something from LA. You could like get on the next flight or whatever, but I'm going to Australia from LA. It's like a day and a half of travel in the air. A day late. <laughs> Top of that. So first I'm thinking, okay, if, even if, even if they let me on this plane, who's gonna pick me up a day later? So, <laughs> You know, no, nobody called me, nothing said, hey, you know, I got nothing. It was, it was my bad. The whole thing was my bad, so I go up to, uh, did you take a taxi to Australia? Is that a taxi? <laughs> Please. Bro, it was so bad. I went up to the counter, I go up to the lady. I'm like, this is a one lifetime opportunity for me to expand my, my musical knowledge and abilities. Can you please help me? It's like, uh, no, sir. Oh, uh, well, is there anyone else that I can speak to? And, um, uh, yeah, she, she hooked me up with the manager or whatever, and I was, it got kind of emotional, and yeah, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, had to, I had to do it. I had to do it. See the other show. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, let me hook you up. Yeah, yeah. So, thankfully, that line worked, and Word. I got on the, 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 the flight I was supposed to be on, but 24 hours later. And thankfully, there are people who came in on that same that same day, so I was able to get a ride. So, <laughs> uh, but I don't suggest you guys do that if you make it. Just double check that date of departure and all that stuff. Um, we can talk more travel tips later because there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes along the way. I have handled proposals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, that thing. So you're at the academy and the record comes up. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was in the program in 1983, came out, and uh, it, was, it was really crazy. I uh, had to do a little press here and there while I was in the program. But um, it, was, it was it was great. It was a great experience there. Uh, I, uh, I remember waking up and uh, they had Simpsons marathon <laughs> in the morning. You know, I was like, shit, I gotta go to see them like shit real quick. I'm gonna hear something really dope. Make a beat, watch Simpsons, and then go. And you get there and they have what is it like international cuisine every day? You're like eating food from a different country. And like at the end of the program, everyone gained like five pounds, ten pounds, something like that. Everyone's just kind of like tugging at their little fatty sides, and um, but aside from that, um, you just you encounter some really, really incredible people, and uh, a lot of the stuff that happened on on my trip, I'll never forget. That you know, um, I was able to build with like like Code Nine, for Code example. Nine. And he and I today are still, you know, working on things and, and building from brand feeder to hybrid dub stuff. And uh, I don't know if we would have linked up had it not been for the Academy. I don't know if I would have linked up with Mark Pritchard if I hadn't go to the Academy and Sound Murder and, uh, and Odyssey and Andrea Triana, and who I, I made the song Tea Leaf Dancers with when I was at the Academy. Boom. Oh, since we're on that, might as well uh -huh. top that. Big tune still. to this day. Um, I mean, so 1983 came out, you know, um, obviously to, to a lot of great press. Um, 
at a, you know, the academy. Academy's done, you're off, you know, back to LA, and, you know, how did things start to progress on your way down? kind of checking for my stuff at the time. I had uh, done this remix for me and Doi Todd, who he was friends with, and uh, he, yeah, he really dug it, and uh, he was, I, I remember, I was with Gaslight Killer, and uh, DJ Kuma, and Kuma. a few others, yeah, Prefuse, and Andy Votel, Cherry Stones, and, and we were supposed to play in this big club in San Francisco called Club Mighty, it was my first time to play a gig there. And I was jazzed, man. I was so jazzed to play in this big old club. We drove there. It took us so long to get there. And I mean, if you drove from LA, it's like maybe five hours. But this this particular time, it took about nine, ten hours. Because we were with some pretty uh, interesting kids, you know? And, um, you know, we rolled up to this club. And uh, they're like, cool. Andy and... Prefuse and Cherry Stones, you guys play in the club, and here's the little outdoor PA for you guys. Coop my guys <laughs> And I was hot. I was like, uh, uh, I know y'all didn't just drive me down here to play on the motherfucking patio. <laughs> like, I kind of stayed home, really. And, uh, and Koopma, Koopma got out the van, he was like, nah, dude, fuck it, we're just gonna make this shit dope. We're gonna make it hot. I'm like, really? This little patio where there's like only room for like 30 people to stand. It's like, all right. We get out the car and Koopma starts destroying this party. Destroying it. Then Gaston Killer comes out. Destroys it. Does not I mean, the whole, the whole club seemed to spill from inside out to this little patio area. And it's like filling the whole streets like a little block party. It was crazy. It was crazy. Then I got to play. And it was, it was really fun. <laughs> And then, um, it, it was fun. And Gaston Killer joined me. And uh, I think Prefuse had come out and all the others had come out. And they saw that this was really um, something. And uh, I think after that, I started getting the phone calls and the emails. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's funny you mentioned that show because I remember one day, I think I was buying some music online or whatnot. And, you know, I might have been buying like a remix or something. And, you know, people were able to kind of like comment about the music and whatnot. And this kid, I think, talked about that one show because he talked about, yeah, you know, like I was going to the show in San Fran, you know, and outdoors, and I see this dude flying loads or like you know, whatever. And the dude basically like wrote on the on, on in his comments like his head was blown halfway across the street, you know, after he heard you know flying lotus, and I was like. Oh shit, like, this is crazy. Well, the remix is crazy as well. So it's funny when you talk about that, I think I, I, I did read about that, that show specifically. And I'll never forget it, seriously, because it, it, was, it was such a, a turning point and, and a lot of things, you know, just the way I, I feel about the live set now. It's like, I don't care if there's like five people there anymore. It's like, if there's five people there in some small ass city in some cold ass place in Europe, those five people probably really, really give a fuck, and I'm gonna do my best, you know. And uh, you know, so <laughs> and seeing them, uh, they, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, I, I learned a lot along the way. I learned a lot, and every day is is that, you know. I'm, I'm always learning. I'm still learning. I'm not trying to be up here like I know everything and shit. I'm just like, I'm just trying to have fun doing this and trying to keep my head up, man, because. You know, making music. I know a lot of you guys are musicians and uh, aspiring musicians. And this shit gets dark. It gets real dark. It gets dark in the studio. It gets dark on the road. But you have to, you have to remember why you got in in the first place and hang on to the essence of of that. It's so important because it's real easy to lose sight of all that when um, you know when when things aren't going your way or when things are really really going your way. Uh, Fuck, man. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta stop about the crime. <laughs>
for you. I need another drink, actually. <laughs> I, I'd love one too, by the way, Fuck a Red Bull. Please. <laughs> Twisted Lime still. So, so at that show, you know, on, you know, see you, some war people were attending. I mean, and then you see the phone calls started. Yeah. And uh, obviously after some, you know, contractual negotiations, whatnot, we, out of the sky, drops this EP called Reset. Yeah. You know, um, any owners of Reset here? Show of hands. Okay. Oh, still not. You no. guys are sweet though. So <laughs> let's 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 drop a little sum off Reset. You know, before we get into that. Mm. So reset is out, you're out of Europe, you're seeing how every day you're going to react. You know, I'll quit some, well, we'll talk about that after. That translates then obviously to um, the full length, which is Los Angeles. Yeah. Owners of Los Angeles, show of hands, full emphatic, two hands. She got two. I mean, she, she downloaded it, liked it, and then bought it. <laughs> or, you know, she bought it for a car and yeah. the, the yard. <laughs> You know, she's like, so she could just, you know, she will, she'll never forget it, basically. Thank I like you. that, I like that. Thank you. Um, so, Los Angeles comes out, obviously, I mean, um, I mean, describe Los Angeles, you know, you titled it because yeah, you love it. First, I, I, I love LA, and I feel like uh, that record was, at the, at the time, I felt like it reflected how I felt about the city. I felt like it was this ever-changing place that had all these little nuts and crannies that, that, you, uh, that you really had to be part of for a little while to really feel it. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, the sound as well, you know, it's, it's definitely some LA texture in there. It's, it's music for the freeway, it's music for, uh, for being at, on, the, on, the, on PCH or whatever, cruising in your whip or whatever. 
some convertible late night shit. Um, so yeah, that's how I see it. I see it as like a its own movie in a way, like my own Blade Runner. If I were to do a Blade Runner soundtrack, or something like that. Let's let's drop a little something from LA still. Big record again that you guys should own for the war. sampled my my aunt's music. <laughs> Don't be scared, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I tried to sample my auntie a couple times and that one I felt was was closer to what I wanted to say with it. So So you mean since we're on the LA topic, uh, let's just kind of like discuss what's happening in LA, what the water tastes like there, because it's obviously something special. Like they got their own flavor. Uh, Again, yeah, any kind of fans of beat music, electronic, whatever you want to call it, you know, right now, you know, and it has been, I say, for a couple of years, but absolutely, ahora, today, boy, you know, LA has turned into like this kind of an epicenter for that sound. And it's actually embarrassing because you're listening to big men talk about, yo, LA this, LA that. You know, if anyone listens to, you know, some of the online shows in, in, in Europe, they're like, they can't get enough of what's going on uh, out of LA, you know. My goodness, Marianne Hobbs, like, if I have to hear her again talk about it, they I'm just going to shoot myself. But, with just cause, I mean, so let's, let's talk about it. I'll you said that. Please do. Please do. Give more time to you. check for me in So, um, let's talk about LA, you know, let's start with something that we actually didn't discuss yet, you know, we'll start with something like Double Lab. Yeah, oh wow. Yeah, Double Lab is, uh, is a uh, online radio station. They've actually just got uh, their own radio show on, on broadcast on, uh, on Friday nights in LA. But they're uh, one of the, one of the, the few who um, were trying to put on some interesting events for a, a cause or purpose, you know, they, they try to think outside the box with some of their, their programming. You know, they, I don't know too many folks in LA doing like ambient showcases out in like Big Sur. You know, they like take an LA party out to Big Sur and people just like trip for a whole night. And they're like, yes, bring pillows and blankets. You know, like, who, who does parties like that, you know? And makes it, makes it the shit. They, they tell you it's dope, they make you do it, <laughs> you know, they, they convince you that it's sick and, you know, they don't really receive much profit off of it, you know, it's all kind of, it's all done by the people who love it, I guess, people who are pledging. Indeed, and, and you know, I mean, I bring up that live simply because, you know, I mean, I think it's part of this, this little bit of, you know, this kind of least fair attitude that they have, that anything goes, uh, and you know you can actually log on and kind of like stream some of their music or not. So definitely check that out. So it's a great mix is there. That's Double Lab. So we'll stay in LA still. You know we obviously have to talk about Low End Theory. Uh, anyone here familiar, familiar with Low End Theory out of LA? Okay, okay, I like that. But even before Low End Theory, I want to touch on uh, the Sketchbook Night, which we haven't really talked about, and that was such a such an influential party. It was a, it's a Tuesday night that Coop went through and he'd have his residents like Take, if, if any of you guys know Take, and Take out of Los Angeles. Ross G was also a resident. Um, yeah, Ross G, definitely. Um, DJ Sacred, the list goes on. And, uh, you know, it'd be cats just hang out in front of this place that is called Little Temple, which is also a dub lab upstairs. Uh, people would just be hanging out in front. People wouldn't even be in the club. We'd just be us, me, Diabolic, Ross G. Take, uh, George Ann Mongo, Eric Coleman, wow. Gas Night Killer, everybody chilling out front, DiBiase. Uh, 
chilling with DiBiase's boombox. We all bring in our CDs, shit we just made over the week, every Tuesday. Like, take, it's got some new shit. I got some new shit. Rashi's got some new shit. We maybe go to the car and turn it up a little louder, you know. But um, that's that's what really drove us. I think at at a point when the sound of LA thing was happening, it was just that you know we were all part of this community. And there was no competition. We were all just like supporting each other. People was building. Everyone had their own sound, so there was no kind of bad blood between anybody. Right? No one was biting and shit. So it was all good. You do your thing. I do mine. And it's love. You know, it's all it's all relative. And uh, it, that's that alone, I think, uh, made that, that was one of the sparks. Things. Yeah, yeah, because sparks. people wouldn't like I said. Oh, eventually people would just show up with music and they wouldn't even go inside a little temple or just be hanging out on the side playing tapes or whatever. So bartenders just mad as hell. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so that was sketchbook and again we'll, we'll then progress to low end theory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, quickly, low end theory, low end theory. Uh, a weekly that was uh, set up by the Daddy Kev maybe two years ago. Daddy Kev is a uh, is the dude holding it down, holding down Alpha Pup, and uh, the the other residents of the Gas Stamp Killer, DJ Nobody, uh, No Can Do, uh, D Styles, y'all fuck with D Styles over here. So 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 so. so. Um, you and Lo and you know, and I, and I speak about Lo and simply because you know outside of LA. You know, Europe. You know, uh, you know, parts of the U.S. and whatnot. You know, people who are into this genre, this music, again, whatever it's called. You know, they are looking to play low end at what point? Like, yeah, and it's like, so happy because they, they probably ain't gonna get that much money either. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you walk away like, all oh, right, right, yeah, yeah, okay, my low end, I got it, I got it. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, it's also a place where you forget that you get paid to do this kind of stuff. You know, whenever I go there, I'm always ready to leave, and then like, Daddy Kev comes through with that handshake that's got money in it, you know? <laughs> I'm like, oh, right, you guys pay me for this stuff. So, you know, so quickly describe Low End. Low End, low end Theory is, you know, your, your club night, but what makes it so fun is just that it's so diverse. You have, you know, you have 16 bit one night, and you'll have Sam I Am, and then you'll have the Mars Volta, then you'll have Hudson Mohawk, then you'll have uh, uh, Computer J and Kuba and so forth. Um, it's been it's been a really crazy thing to watch. Tech Itch, Tech Itch played low end theory, it was sick. It needs to do that again. <laughs> Y'all fuck with Tech Itch over here? Yeah. Yeah, you know, they put a fan right here, front row. Um, so, and again, and this is just to kind of you know, let you guys know that the, the energy in Los Angeles is, is one that is, is, is kind of like, you know, it's rippling all over the world. And again, you know, if you hear, you know, Europeans talk about how they'd like to play low end when they was talking to Onra. Onra was just yeah. in, in Los Angeles for two weeks. They didn't even get a look for low end. It's like, <laughs> he's like, he's out of you know, low end is not crazy, you know, like people are just like, you know, they're selling their furniture, go to LA and play low end, you know, and it's heavy. And by the way, just, you know, we're not trying to lose you guys, but I mean, you could just Google it or just go to lowend.com and get into that. But I think it's very important to describe what's happening in LA and, you know, and the city that, you know, sprung a man right here and yeah. on to bigger and better things, obviously. Definitely if you guys are, are planning to come visit us, make sure you have a, a Wednesday in LA. Boom. So you can check it out. True that. Uh, and they're all about the sound there. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Not these rinky dick speakers that we have, some of these clubs right here, like these guys are like, yeah, it's straight your hair. It's that face mounting <laughs> sound system where <laughs> you just don't want to get too close to the face. <laughs> <laughs> you just get sick. <laughs> and I see a little mouth will vibrate off. No doubt. So now, uh, let's get back to some of the music. LA's come out. Again, a world, you know, of acclaim, just press all over the place, you know. You know, again, LA being regarded in 2008, I believe, it was when it dropped, right? Uh, as one, uh, easily one of the top records 
uh, by entering press all over that year. Um, and eventually they keep going. We start to put out these little EPs uh, with bonus cuts here and there. Yeah. Now, EP1 drops, you know, me with a couple bonus cuts. Do we have a find out? Do we? Uh, I, got, I got a couple things. Couple. Okay, because we we'll play a little bonus. We'll, we'll play it on the second EP. Okay, let's play this. Actually, before we get into the second EP, we'll actually play it. We're we'll going to have <laughs> All right. Anybody know about Mike Slot? He was in the, the program here in, in Toronto, right? Was it in Toronto? No, he was much earlier, actually. Oh, right. Okay. Hudson played here. He was in a thing last year. There it is. How do I it? You know, true story. I remember um, when, when you know, Mike Slau was kind of finishing this track and what have you. You know, true story. He it to me in the subway in New York. And I was like, oh my goodness. And it eventually came out, you know, and I remember it was on his MySpace. And I left the message like, my wedding song! You know, <laughs> laughed his head off. But I was like, yo, real talk, it's gonna be my wedding song still. But Mike Slot, that was a, a remix to uh, a song that uh, was on an Ellen record. Mike Slot remixed it for your man. Mike Slot, an RBMA graduate, graduate from I think 2003 or 4, somewhere around there. Probably in the early days. But I mean, sort of to kind of drive home the point that, you know, um, the graduate, the grads from the program often enough know each other and end up working together definitely at some point in time. Yeah, even on this EP, I mean, I just just ran, I mean, you got Mike Slot, who was in the program, Sam I Am, who was here, knows that. Yeah, I don't know. There's so much now, Jarrell was in the program. Yeah, JJ was in the program. Did Sal Murder did a remix for me, who was, who was uh, part of the tech team in Melbourne. You know, it, it, it was, oh, man, it was so cool. I can't believe we did that. <laughs> you know, it was, and I, I saw some hands go up when he asked if anyone that was trying to apply. And I really, really, really think that if you guys have any interest in, in taking your musical careers further, you, you try and apply for the program. You guys got nothing to lose. And it's, it really is just, you know, for you, for nothing. You know, like, you don't got to give them anything. You don't got to pay for nothing. They do this all for you. They're, you know, they're just trying to build this community up even more. You know, I, and... What he didn't mention is uh, also that they have these they have these amazing gigs. Like everyone will be able to. Ooh, it's gonna be in London next year. I don't know if you guys know that, but you know we've been talking about LA for a minute. London is really cracking too with their scene and their electronic scene, their their dubstep thing. It's really jumping. Um, so I mean, it's an opportunity to get a free ride in London. And get a and, I, and get a gig as well, not just to show up. You get to play. You know, everyone everyone who can can play will play, and uh, it's probably not going to be with anybody whack either. So, you know that you know, you know call Pritchard whack. Yeah, exactly. You play with Code Nine or fucking whoever. You know, it's like it's going to be dope. So, I, I really think if anyone is interested in this whole thing, go for the London one for sure, for sure, because. They do one in Texas. I'm not gonna be there. Like, also, like you gotta, you got to. I mean, like, you might wanna just. Oh, wait, 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 wait another one. But uh, London is the one. So uh, definitely, definitely go for it. So L, um, you know, trilogy of EPs. You know, you decide to put together one drop, two drop, three is about to drop. Um, I mean, you're obviously working on a new record at Warp as well. Um, you mentioned that you felt that this was potentially going to be your greatest work, you know, yeah. coming. And why so? Uh, to be honest, man, I just feel that I'm 
more connected to the source than I've ever been in my entire life. I feel like that the thing that happens now is more honest and more real than it's ever been in my entire life. And it's, it's natural, it's not something that I have to reach for, it just happens. And I can go there, I can be in that zone, that space, where you guys, you guys are creative people, I'm sure. And you, you ever feel like sometimes you'll be working and then all of a sudden it's like nine in the morning the next day and you just get lost. You're like, how did this happen? You just get lost in that zone, that space that uh, you know, people have to meditate to get to sometimes. You know, it's, uh, it's a really, really special, special place that um, uh, if, if you, you approach your creativity in uh, an honest way and uh, try to give back something, I think it's way more accessible. But uh, yeah, I've been feeling that. I've been feeling that and it, it feels good. And I know that, uh, you know, I don't want to get all spiritual on you guys right now. A lot of folks ain't trying to hear that shit. I was gonna about the beats, but it's so important to me um, that I stress that I'm, I'm really doing this to, to connect, to make that connection. And um, yeah, I think uh, it's feeling pretty good right now. So. Good. And, you know, we all look forward to it as I speak for everyone, I'm sure. Um, and, and one thing I, 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 you know, I, in my kind of assessment, um, I must say you're absolutely busy, you know, between touring, between obviously working on music, and between, you know, this little thing that we'll talk about right now, which is called Brain Feeder. Who here is familiar with Brain Feeder? All right now. All right. We do. You guys are special people. Definitely. For those who are not, we're about to get into this series of business yeah. called Brain Feeder right now. Tell them about Brain Feeder. Brain Feeder is that thing that I saw, uh, that potential that I saw when I did my, uh, my first record. I, I saw that there was this, uh, this call for the sound, this thing that's happened, this future hip hop, electronic, thing, whatever. And um, I, I felt like it was my place, uh, my responsibility to step up since I've been pushing it so hard. Uh, I, I want to be the guy to give to people instead of, say, work, for example, because they didn't do it, I did it, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I came up with my album, you know, and I, I, I really feel like there's some really incredible people coming out of LA and all around the world that are, are being slept on, and I want to be the one that, you know, to help them have that push, man. Uh, I, I feel like since people are looking in my direction, I can kind of shine a light on some other shit, you know. And um, yeah, it's it's again, it's it's a thing that's just become way bigger than me, and it's become way bigger than LA and, and what have you. So I just I have to do it. I have to because so I want I want to see it go further. I want people to take what we're doing and flip it into some other shit. I want to see that, you know. Oh, that, that's so. Brain Feeder essentially is, uh, I guess, like a, you mentioned, like a digital label yeah. uh, and kind of a conglomerate as well. Yeah, it's, it's a digital label at the moment, and we're we're slowly making our way into vinyl and CD and all that other old stuff. <laughs> Important old stuff, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Now let's talk about the roster of Brain Feeder. I mean, first up the back, Ross G, Sam I Am, uh, Doctor Strange, Luke Teebs, Monopoly, Lauren. Matthew, David, Rebecca Raff. We're getting some really, really crazy folks on that I don't know if I should name. I think yeah, we, we can get like, like, you know, we'll it. Boom, 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 boom. You bring that here, but it's, it's, boom, it's actually boom, here sit. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, let's talk about some of the cats that are on right now. Uh, let's talk about Sam Am. Let's play maybe a uh, Sam I Am joint. For those who do not know, by show of hands. Sam I Am. Who knows Sam I Am? Show of hands, yeah. please. Okay, now. Oh, man. I love Sam I Am. He's such a little <laughs> shit. Like, <laughs> shoot him in the face. He actually is. Boy, he's, like, uh, he's my neighbor, so I can say that stuff about him. He might, oh, man, that's Sam. He's such a great producer. He's a little shit, let me tell you. All right? But I will say, it's, it's so cool because, you know, I get to come home and uh, he, he lives right over the entrance of the building. So sometimes when he's working, you can just like hear some new Sam I Am beats when you come home. It's, it's probably, it's 
It's probably one of the little things I'll miss when I leave that place. So, in the same mind, by the way, 2007 Red Bull graduate from Toronto. Mm. Hold that. Mm. Um, uh, uh, let's get into some other cats from Brain Feeder. Uh, let's get into some Monopoly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tell me yeah. about Monopoly real quick. Monopoly, he's, um, he's a little guy. He's a little guy. <laughs> and I, I always noticed the little dudes because Dilla was a little guy. And it's all the little guys who gotta be like, yo. I got some shit, you know what I'm saying? Where, where are the little guys in the house? Yeah, put, put your hands up. Yeah. Make, 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 well, make noise if you we just small as you are. I want to hear it. <laughs> Next time a girl's like, oh, you're little, be like, did you hear what Flyball said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, little. Yeah. Don't let the smooth little, case fool you. Yeah, little dude, big sound, you know? See the sound he says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See? So, um, Monopoly, young little cat who's, I believe, barely 20 yeah, years old. Yeah, you gotta sneak him in the club, man. He's a, a young dude in, in college, and uh, he's, he, I, I don't know, he's just, he's been a big fan of this thing, and it's weird, I was, I was like, I don't know, man, he's, I don't know if he, he can, he's, he's a fan, he's more of a fan than this thing. And then one day I got this tune in my email. Like I said, it's one of those things, it's real easy, it's real easy to get caught up in this shit and just start hating on everything. Like, I know I'm going on the road with motherfuckers and they just be like, no. <laughs> I do, you know this, dope. Like, dude, what happened? I was, I was out there, like, I was just checking out Dorian concept. He was just like, <laughs> like you, you know it's dope. You can't, you can't hate on it, you know what I'm saying? Just let the dude have his props. You can eat too, you can do your shit too. But it's dope and it's fun to, to like, you know, be a fan still. And I think that the, the further I get into this thing, the more people I meet, uh, generations ahead of mine, of course, like people who've been in it longer. It's a lot of hate, man. It's a lot of hate. Barrels of hate. <laughs> But I just say it like this, there's not enough time to hate because there's not enough time to listen to good music already. Yeah. Like, I don't have time, I don't have time to email, like, man, it's hitting me up, it's like, oh my god, you know, so, and as you said, yeah, a, lot of people, a lot of people wonder, like, 
oh man, whatever happened to so-and-so? They made some stuff and then I didn't hear from them no more. They stop making music. People stop making music because they fall out of love with it. They stop loving making music. And they stop loving making music because why? Because they hate everything. And they can't let themselves get inspired anymore. They can't connect to the source anymore. They can't get into that zone anymore because they're just like, oh, wow, well, whatever. Everything sucks. <laughs> if it wasn't made in the 70s, it sucks. Good job, good job. So, I mean, you got this brain feeder thing going on, obviously, and, you know, and we talked about this, you know, uh, briefly, and, you know, I'll, I'll make the comparison. And again, you know, I would suggest for everyone to become familiar with the brain feeder uh, content and, and whatnot. Go to brainfeedersite.com simply because it is, you know, brain feeder flying lotus will eventually basically become one. It's, yeah, you know, and I, we're trying to take it beyond what we're trying to release. We're trying to expand the brain feeder thing to just represent the beat community more so than just us. You know, we want to, if no such thing as doing a show, we want to tell folks about it. If, if the homie Exile's got another record coming out, I'll be out there talking about it. Anything that I think is worth mentioning, I, I want to be behind it. You know, I, I, I really feel like all of us here, all of us here, we can all eat off this shit, for real. If motherfuckers really put their dicks on it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Seriously, I don't mean to get graphic, <laughs> but you gotta put your dick on the track, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let them see that shit. <laughs> Let them feel it, you know what I'm saying? They gotta feel it. You, got, I feel, you know what I'm saying? It's that swagger. Should I say swagger instead? They don't have the, you know what I'm saying? Piece of terms. Come on, man. You, know, you wouldn't put me on the couch if I said swagger. <laughs> I gotta keep it interesting. Yes. So, you know, the brain feeder, you know, we, we obviously know what to expect, uh, you know, later on this year and for, 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 for some time to come. You know, a, a very a very accomplished roster um, that you've been taking on the road. And, and, and speaking of the road, one thing I, I kind of want to get into uh, is, is your performance. And, you know, and again, I don't expect too many hands up, so I won't be hurt or disappointed. He won't either. You know, it's his first time in Toronto. By show of hands, who has seen Flying Lotus perform? One, two, I know you. So three people. That's all good. Perfect. Because perfect. Which is perfect. Yes. You know. Are you the, yeah. the, the thing? Come on. He doubled up. Oh, my man's doubled up. I thought you look so familiar. <laughs> so, <laughs> and let me tell you, man, I almost died that day. I almost died on me. Like, I remember, um, there's a part, I think I'd already played already in Code 9. It was going on, and he, um, he started playing that, uh, like the thuggish, ruggish bone flip, and now we're back. We're full circle. Drum. Dude, I almost died in the club. I mean, like, for so, I was so excited to hear that in the club in Montreal, and uh, I was really wasted. And uh, I remember feeling like my knees do this shit. I don't know why. I mean, it's the adrenaline or whatever. Start. <laughs> Music can do that to you, you know? Music can make you feel all sorts of things. It can make you feel like, uh, and you know, the reason why I picked my name, you know, music can make you feel like you're flying. And that's the thing that I, I love about it. I, I, uh, I gravitate towards that feeling, man. And as I get older and do more music and get more knowledge on this shit, it's just like that feeling becomes even stronger, you know? Um, so, yeah, Montreal was fun. <laughs> so you 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 toured quite a lot, whether it be Green Field or yourself or whatnot. And, and uh, you know, my I mean moment, kind of seeing how things were going on, um, because I heard it read, and uh, I went to you know BFNY. You know, uh, I saw I was at the uh, New York show, and actually I was at the uh, Barcelona as well. Barca, and then wow, oh, that's true, Barca, and uh, Museum of Natural History. All right, all right, as well. Uh, that was so fun, man. I got to play for it. a self-contained uh, ecosystem and universe. It was. It was like it was a little universe in a bubble. Boom, and like all, of, all it can just exist on its own, all little organisms and stuff that need no help from man or whatever. I thought that was the illest thing in the world. Something in little beats. 
<laughs> so, I mean, when you perform, you know, and, and people will see this, by the way, who's going to the show tonight? Please, I want to see every hand up. Oh, okay. I'll say that's a 60%. You know, tickets at the door still. Um, you know, people are going to witness something, I think, uh, in all likelihood, especially not Toronto, but in all likelihood, uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be a first. And I, I will say, just the show alone, there, there's something to behold, let alone the sound. Um, I mean, and I do realize, I mean, I mean Henry is so sweet. Oh man, he's so sweet. It's cool. It's just it's cool. cool. It's, it's, it's a funny show. Up. It's a funny it's scene, not my pocket. I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, it's something you guys need to see. And, and um, actually, I remember, you know, hearing about the show, and, you know, and being in Miami, and seeing guys perform with this kind of application. And, and that's, you know, part of what we want to talk about as well. Uh, this application called Able to Live. Now, I don't know some of the, the people in the place, whether you be DJ producing but not by show of hands, who's using live right now, or is about to, who's thinking about it. All right, we're gonna talk about that real quickly, uh, because it is, it who's gigging up. with Ableton? Who's playing shows with Ableton right now? Show of hands. One hand, one or two, 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 okay, three, four, four, four. Two and a half. Who wants to do their shows with Ableton? Yeah, trying, trying. trying. Yeah. It, it really helps if I know, so don't be shy. Who wants to learn some Ableton shit? Okay, cool. okay. <laughs> Suddenly, every hand goes up like it's cool. I don't feel whack now. It's cool, man. It's cool. I'm as long as he doesn't see my like two in the back, I'm just like, you know, as long as he doesn't see my face at all. Um, but we're going to talk about that simply because, uh, I mean, I, I came from a bit of a uh, kind of a, you know, classic DJ background, fine, or uh, doubles, etc., etc. You know, but one thing I didn't realize when I saw him in that work, I was just like, Jesus Christ, what's going on here? And, you know, a couple guys put me on it, kind of gave me a little schooling on what it could do and whatnot. And I was like, all right, let me, let me do a little bit of research. Then I seen my man perform one day, and I was like, oh, snap. Uh, powerful program, I mean. Uh, and apparently, I mean, it, it was really kind of a production thing that turned into like a performance application and all encompassing, really. So we're going to talk about a bit of how he kind of puts his, you know, his sets together and, you know, how he arranges possibly, but, you know, you'll get to hear tonight especially how that all comes together. Um, so now you have a show coming up. What's the first thing that comes close to your mind? Where's the toilet? All right. Because <laughs> you're nervous, right? Is that always, it? always, all right. always nervous. So after you're done, all right, sorry. All right, no more toilet humor. Uh, just read my Twitter page, you want more of that? So, let's talk about that, your performance and how you kind of put it together. Uh, the, way, the way I use Ableton uh, in the live setting, I, I have kind of like four different ways of doing things, three or four different ways. Is one way is your traditional kind of DJ style, uh, if I wanted to play a full song. And, uh, and sometimes it's, it's cool to play the full song because if I strip things down, you, you don't get the essence of it and it's in, in its entirety, the way uh, it was mixed and everything. So sometimes it's good to play the whole song. And then sometimes it's cool to have songs that are stripped into little parts. So if there's a melody from, uh, say, massage situation, and I wanted to use the drums from Golden Diva, I can be able to do that in Ableton, and then I can play the whole version of uh, the homies tunes if I wanted to, like right out of that. And then something else I like to do is, is to do like live looping with percussion, doing like drum parts, and then you know looping that up and then mixing that with some other melodies and what have you. There's, there's room for so much more, and you know, I'm only using a fraction of it. And you know, I'm no expert in Ableton, but I, I definitely, uh, I, I'll say this about Ableton, like half, half of learning is knowing how to get yourself out of the shit when you're in it. You know, like when you're like maybe mid set and you make that move that's like, oh shit. <laughs> right, I didn't mean to hit that button. How do you get out of that? What do you do? You know, that's, that's the other half of the battle, and that comes with experience, I guess, but uh, it's, it's a really fun program, and uh, uh, if you, especially if you're already doing some other kind of musical stuff, too, if you're playing instruments, and, or a vocalist, or whatever, it, it can 
only benefit you in that. So if you're playing keys, you can you can like record yourself playing your key section with your drum parts that are in Ableton and are all chopped up or whatever. There's so many ways of using it as well. Like everyone that uses Ableton that I know uses it different than I do, which is great. You know, you know ain't nobody biting in that. So and that's that's a, that's the reason why uh, you know it, it's it's just become this this crazy thing on the internet and, and blogs and everything just because there's several ways of approaching this uh, this software and uh, I don't know what if if you guys have any questions about anything or you guys have any interest in at all in how I, I, ru I run it I, I'd love to help out like I said I'm no expert and I'm sure you guys could probably show me some stuff too but. But I mean, one thing, and you know, for the people who know the music and whatnot, because you know, just say you know a song, and you're like, okay, this is how the song goes, but then you'll hear like a particle, and you're like, okay, where are the drums at? Then, or you'll hear the drums, you're like, okay, well, where's the rest of the loop and whatnot? Yeah. And I guess you can gradually bring everything in on its yeah. own, or like peak it, you know. Yeah, it's, it's so people. fun to be able to strip things out for, especially for the people who kind of know the songs, you know. It's, it, that's when the stripping becomes like, way more useful. You know, if I'm in a crowd, I'm like a record release party or something, and everyone's already heard the shit, and I can just play the melody, people know what's up. And so it's, it's fun. But you'll get in the night, like when we were in Whistler, and you know, a lot of people didn't know any of the tunes, so I could play like the full songs and things and, and work it that way. It was just, Depending on the setting and the environment, the show can change every time, and that's that's another thing that's fun about it. It's, it's never the same show twice for me, um, so there's always that room for oh shit, <laughs> you know. Like there's always that room for danger, and I love that. I love the fact that I can fuck it up at any moment. Um, it could be total shit in a second. It's awesome, you know. It keeps like, it fun, like what I thought almost happened last night, but yeah. it's like but everything came. Full circle, and I hear, I heard the chords come in. I'm like, wow, here we go. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, that was heavy. Um, and uh, so, so basically, on, again, on a performance level, you know, and again, I'm, I'm about to get into it. I'll be honest, for the end of that one, come on, Pete the Man, still when I'm playing, yeah. you know, Ableton's about to be, you know, part for the chorus. Um, I mean, and again, you know, I really urge for everyone to come out tonight and, and see this and hear it at work, especially because you may not be able to see it work, you know, behind the set with the MIDI control or whatnot. But once you hear the songs come in, the potential uh, that's available as a performance software, yeah. I, I, I personally think it's crazy, and I have to just dip in and be yeah, like, yo, so, because you know, you can, you, if you're a visual artist too, you can incorporate your visual art and stuff like that. You can again you can play your instruments on top of this, have your your vocals coming in, everything. You can, you can work with a live band. You can, yeah, the, the possibilities are limitless. And that's also one of the problem with it too. It's just that there's just so much you can do. So much. You okay. kind of, yeah, you kind of need some limitations. I feel, but yeah, it's just it's just expanding. I feel like the program is the future, even though I don't really produce in it. I feel like uh, anyone who's really getting into this whole electronic thing, I think Ableton is is the the choice because it's just getting crazier and crazier, and you don't want to be like five years from now trying to learn it if you uh, if you've just been thinking about it. You come from Pro Tools or whatever. It's like get get a demo, check it out, try it out, dig it, roll with it. If not, get something else. Um, uh, it really isn't about the gear anyway. At the end of the day, it's all about what you put into it, and your brain, and your third eye, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it is and, third eye. And, and speaking of the gear and I'm putting into it, um, yesterday, so we're sitting around in Calgary, just Calgary, yeah, just you know, waiting for this thing to start. Uh, you're bored, and uh, you basically got your, an iPhone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Go for it, I'll be right back. Yeah. No. Sure, yeah, Yes. Uh, yesterday, I kind of wanted to, uh oh, oh, there we go, yeah. I kind of wanted to put something together in Ableton because it's not really my my act, if you will. You know, I, I wanted to see what I could do with it. And I, I only wanted to use the little internal microphone off the Mac. I didn't want to get out of the bed. I just wanted to see what was possible, what I could flip if I just like, you know, clanked on a little, 
master hit the pin up against the remote control. I refused to like get up to plug in my laptop. You know, I, was just, I just wanted to see. I wanted to see if I could make something. And, you know, it's it's cool. I'm gonna play it anyway. For some people that's really inspiring, for some people that's shit, whatever. But it's um, it's possible, and it's possible and, and accessible, and it's here for you. And uh, you know, I, I, I suggest if you guys are interested, you give it a shot. I'm gonna show you guys the session here, so you can see how I kind of put that thing together. Sounds better. If you're doing like electronic music, 
uh, logic sounds the best out output, I think. And uh, just keep doing that shit, bro. Just keep learning that and take it even further. You know, keep trying it out. You know, take your mixes on the road and 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 uh, you know, use use your EQing and you'll get it. You'll get it eventually, man. Uh, question at the bottom, my man with the glasses. Hey, uh, what do you do when you get like bogged down creatively, like if you're having a hard time in the studio? Uh, then the question was, I'm just going to repeat the question again for everyone. Uh, what happens, you know, when Flying Lotus has kind of hit a bit of a brick wall? You mean like, like writer's block and stuff? Yeah, or just like you're working on a beat and you know, like it's, you, you can't get into the sound the way you sound and you like... I just delete that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I say it, you know what I do, bro? Honestly, now that I've been doing this Ableton shit, what I've been doing is like, if there's something decent in there, I'll just take that little bit of it and export it as a stem, and I'll have that for later to play with live. But, you know, if that shit ain't sounding dope after like 20 minutes of sounding like some shit, I'll just like, X, Dad, would you like to save? Do not save. You know? There's no time, dude. There's no time. When I got when I go home from this trip, I got three days, and I gotta do some more shit. So when I'm at home, dude, it's the factory time. And as far as ideas and hidden blocks are concerned, I, I honestly believe, especially like when you're making music for for the source, when you're connected to the source, there's no limitations, bro. The ideas will never stop. You'll be in a place of like endless, endless, endless possibilities. You know, I, there's, I, I, I know for sure I got a billion beats at least in my head, bro. Or some things that are gonna happen. And I know you do too. The ideas will never stop. I encourage you all, if you guys. Are, oh man, I'll never make a tune that sounds as good as this. What about blah, 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 all that? Just keep doing this shit. Have fun with it. You know, have fun, and the, the more fun you're having, the, the more risks you're taking, I think. And uh, the more risks you're taking, uh, you know, you already know. So, yeah, bro. My man, the blue hat right there. Cool. Yeah, I'm wondering if you, uh, within Ableton, if you worked with the, the video feature at all. Not or, yet, uh, man. Yeah, I, I would definitely would like to. It's just, it's, it's tough, because I'm, I'm really trying to focus in on this record right now. and. And me doing that means actually stepping away from Ableton because I want to work with the band on my next tours as well. So, um, uh, yeah. And the question was, by the way, uh, if uh, Flying Lotus had planned, uh, any plans to work with, I guess, a video feature uh, of, uh, of Ableton Live? Yeah. I mean, obviously, with uh, some capabilities there. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't fucked with it to be honest. And I, I know some people who have, and I know it's really powerful. Uh, but I got, I got some friends who do that stuff, and they're like, their heads are in that, and I'd rather build with them and let them do the visuals. That's just me. But um, I, I'm sure you know, there's some people right now who are doing some really crazy, really, really crazy stuff with their, their own visuals and. You know, doing what the Serato, like the live VJing and whatnot. Exactly. So, uh, that's it. But uh, you know, I don't have that much time. <laughs> yeah. Um, any more questions? Uh, my man, right here. I got you in a second. See. This is kind of a two-part question, but uh, do you find it difficult to balance um, starting a label, Brain Feeder, um, together with being a musician? Definitely. The second part of the question is uh, any, like any um, possibility of signing Pokemon stuff. <laughs> let me let me repeat the question. Question was, um, where does uh, Flying Lotus fly all the time, uh, handling brain feeder affairs? And the second part was whether he was going to sign a particular artist that you're going to talk about real quick. Uh, yeah, first part of the question, definitely, bro. It's hard, man. It's hard to do all this stuff. It's hard to have friends. It's hard to be a good grandson and brother and all that stuff. And, Still be, be in the lab and being able to give joints away, just giving tunes away on MySpace and being able to come up with mixes, or whatever. It's tough, man. But I love it. I love it. I'm gonna flip it. I'm gonna keep doing it. You know, make it work for me. And uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, and you know, eventually, you know, I, I think that you know when. If, you keep doing your thing, you get people around you who want to help out. And you, I definitely you know, take advantage of the folks who want to help, you know. And uh, 
I, I need all the help I can get, dude. Seriously. So, but the second second part of the question, Toki Monster. She's she's a dope producer. Um, I'm waiting for the record, then we'll see what happens. Alright. Um. Yes. Yeah. Peace, man. Uh, you like you miss like with Jamaica that like, you reggae. Oh man, I love, I love everybody. I mess with everybody. But um, yeah, I, I have just a conversation we were having actually. And the question was whether uh, you know flag owners would you know particularly work with maybe a, a reggae artist or whatnot. I know Ross G. Yeah, right. Messes with that all day, all day. Dude. You know, uh, but you know, do you see that in the future? Definitely, definitely. Um, you know, it's, it's just a matter of when and a matter of who. You know, I, I'm I'm open to working with with folks. It's not it's not a problem. I, I love to do it. It's just a matter of when and having the right tune and everything. You know, I don't like to sit around and be like, okay, today we're gonna make a tune that sounds like this. It never happens that way. And if if I ever try it, it sounds like shit. Serious doo doo. You know, I'd be like. I get halfway through and I'm like, ah, right, fuck this. And then I turn the tempo down and then, you know, add the crazy drum and then it's totally different, you know? It's, it's never, never the way I imagine it to be, you know? And uh, thank God. And, uh, you know, as far as collaborating, that's, that's open, man. That's the same, it's the same thing for that, you know? Folks come through LA, yo. I'm around, let's work, let's do it. Let me try to come up with some shit, you know? So, yeah, are, are you suggesting something about that question? <laughs> well, you know, maybe we take we could take that, uh, I mean, on, on, on the side, I mean, do the barbecue. Uh, I'm gonna take a few more questions and I'm probably gonna have to wrap it up. I'll get you in a second. I got you right now in the glasses. Cool, so my question is, um, has sampling ever limited how far you can take your music? And I'm talking, like, about respectful, you know, tasteful sampling, not like, Endless looping, but yeah, no, never. I, I think that especially with now we have computers, you know, we can take a little sample and do so much with it. There's, there's no, there's no rules, man. You know, there's, it's only become part of the texture. You know, it's, it's only part of the texture. You know, I think about it now as like every record I sample is like a musician. I can have Jack D. Jeanette playing on my album or Alice Coltrane, and then I can have Ice Cube saying some crazy shit at the beginning of it, you know, it's the intro, you know? It's, it's all available, you know, and, and again, there's no rules and no one sued me yet, so I'm straight. You say a word. Um, just give me one question, actually. I'll get you your, your light in a second, right here. Um, I just have two questions, actually. What's that? Two, quick, quick, quick. All right, uh, first question is, um, like, do you, or did you ever, like, record, like, just sounds around you, like, a little, Dude, all the time, all the time. You know, it, a lot of people ask me, what's that sound on, you know, on your, your stuff? What's that crazy thing? And I'll tell you, it's just, it's, I record the worst stuff, you know? <laughs> My sources are the worst. I grab the dirtiest piece of vinyl. I, grab, I got the worst turntable you can purchase. You know, I got the worst needle on that turntable. You know, <laughs> it's just how I roll. You know, I try to make it work. You know, um, I'll take anything I can find and then try and flip it. I don't really care to have the cleanest sound, personally. Some people are really into that pristine thing and getting the cleanest source, and I gotta have the dopest mic and the dopest compressor. It's, it's all toys, man, all toys. It's just, it comes down to that sound in the end and what you make of it. You said you have a second part, quick. Your question was, um, do you have any like plans still with the film? Yeah, definitely, man. I'm more so doing animation lately. Been taking my little drawings and, and doing stuff in Flash with them and whatnot. And it's, it's, I realized that me making animation is like what I enjoyed about making music is just the fact that I could do it my own on the, in the cave, you know, at late, late hours at night. No one can tell me shit. You know, I come up with a little universe. That's it. I don't have to convince people that uh, my idea is cool and they should be involved and help me put it together. You know, that's what's tough about film for me is just that like, you know, like, man, fuck, I think it's cool, all right? Why do I have to convince 40 other people to hold some lights for me when I can just make a little drawing or whatever and it's all, you know, flip it. You know? But um, 
Yeah, I, I definitely want to do some more film stuff, man. But you know, it's just this music thing has got me by the balls right now. Same word. Ultimate and last question, my man, Blue. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm a flash animator. You don't need to be. My humble. question is, when you went to Europe um, and you went to war, did you hang out with like Ostecker and all of you? Yeah, bro, when they got me high and told me about drugs. <laughs> no, I didn't. No. No. They hung out with me. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I've, you know, I've. Uh, How were it like, did it inspire you or anything? Or like, you just like. The people, bro. The people. You know, they're all people and they're all still learning how to get the sound that they want. No one's happy. But, um, you know, I've. Who would I be? Uh, you know who's really cool? That guy Clark. He's really cool. That guy Clark is dope. As far as like Apex and Square Pushers and all that stuff, I, you know, I don't, I don't hear the best stories about them, to be honest. I don't hear that they're nice people or approachable folks. So I'm just trying to fuck with folks who are on some, some like, like-minded like shit, actually. I ain't got time to wait for motherfuckers to be part of the legacy or try to be part of someone else's legacy. I'm trying to make my own shit pop off, you know what I mean? So. Go figure. I feel like, you know, I spent a lot of time, a lot of time reaching out to people. I spent a lot of time waiting to get emails back from people. But it's like, man, I can, I can do this. I can make my own universe and my own legacy. You know, I can find somebody and, you know, I could, we can make some shit that's brand new. That no one's heard yet. So why not roll with that? I hear, I hear things. Say a word, and with those prophetic words, we are going to wrap up. Um, I definitely want to thank my man Flat Lotus for taking this time. Thank you guys for Don't forget.